All right, folks, gather round. We're about to dive into the wild world of Silicon Valley unicorns. And no, I'm not talking about magical horses with glitter farts. I'm talking about WeWork and Uber. These companies burst onto the scene like they were the second coming of Steve Jobs. They promise to revolutionize everything from how we work to how we move around cities. And for a hot minute, we all bought into it. WeWork was going to reinvent office space. Uber was going to make car ownership obsolete. They were the cool kids at the tech party and everyone wanted a piece of the action. Investors were throwing money at them like it was confetti at a New Year's Eve party. And why wouldn't they? These companies were valued in the billions before they even turned a profit. It was like the dot-com boom all over again, but with better haircuts and more kombucha. But here's the thing, beneath all the hype and the fancy pitch decks, there was something fishy going on. These companies weren't really tech companies at all. They were just traditional businesses wearing Silicon Valley cosplay. It's like putting a fedora on a pigeon and calling it Frank Sinatra. It might look cool for a second, but at the end of the day, it's still just a pigeon. So, how did we get here? How did two companies that essentially rent out office space and drive people around become the darlings of the tech world? And more importantly, what can we learn from their rise and fall? Buckle up, because we're about to take a wild ride through the land of tech mirages, where nothing is quite what it seems and the only thing disrupted is our common sense. Let's start with WeWork, the company that tried to convince us that renting out office space was somehow revolutionary. Their pitch was simple. We're not just renting offices, we're building communities. It's like your local gym saying they're not just a place to work out, they're reinventing human physiology. WeWork's founder, Adam Newman, sold this vision with the charisma of a cult leader and the fashion sense of a Brooklyn hipster. WeWork's business model was essentially this. Lease a bunch of office buildings, divide them up into smaller spaces, add some ping pong tables and free beer, and then rent them out at a premium. They called it space as a service. I call it subletting with snacks. But hey, they threw around words like AI and big data. So suddenly, they were a tech company worth $47 billion. That's right, $47 billion for a company that was essentially a very ambitious landlord. But here's where things get interesting. WeWork was losing money faster than a compulsive gambler in Vegas. In 2018, they lost $1.9 billion on $1.8 billion in revenue. That's like saying, for every dollar we made, we spent two. But don't worry, we'll make it up in volume. It turns out that when you're paying premium prices for prime real estate and then subletting it at a loss, you're not disrupting anything except maybe your own bank account. The House of Cards finally came tumbling down in 2019 when WeWork tried to go public. Suddenly, all those fancy words and promises of revolution couldn't hide the fact that this was just a real estate company with really good marketing. Investors took one look at their financials and said, wait a minute, this emperor has no clothes. WeWork's valuation plummeted, Newman was ousted, and the IPO was scrapped. It was like watching a tech bubble pop in real time, complete with craft beer and artisanal popcorn. Now let's shift gears and talk about Uber, the company that promised to revolutionize transportation, but ended up being a very expensive way to avoid parallel parking. Uber's pitch was simple. Push a button, get a ride. It was like magic, except instead of pulling a rabbit out of a hat, they were pulling a Toyota Camry out of thin air. And just like that, they were hailed as the future of transportation. Uber's business model was straightforward connect drivers with passengers through an app, take a cut of each fare, and voila, you're a tech company. Never mind that taxis have been doing essentially the same thing for decades, but Uber had an app, so suddenly it was worth billions. It's like putting wheels on a suitcase and claiming you've reinvented travel. Sure, it's convenient, but let's not get carried away. But here's the catch. Uber, like WeWork, 
was burning through cash faster than a Tesla on ludicrous mode. In 2019, they lost $8.5 billion. That's billion with a B. To put that in perspective, that's like losing the entire GDP of Haiti in a single year. And yet, investors kept throwing money at them like they were at a strip club with unlimited ATMs. Why? Because Uber kept insisting they were a tech company, not just a glorified taxi service. The problem is, Uber's technology isn't really that special. The app is nice, sure, but it's not exactly curing cancer. The real innovation of Uber was finding a way to skirt labour laws and offload all the expensive parts of running a taxi service, like owning cars and providing benefits to drivers, onto independent contractors. It's like if I started a restaurant where I didn't own the kitchen, didn't employ the chefs, and just took a cut of every meal sold. I'd probably lose billions too, but hey, at least I'd be disrupting the food industry. So, we've got two companies that claim to be tech innovators, but we're really just putting a Silicon Valley spin on age-old industries. It's like when your dad tries to be cool by using slang from the 90s, it's kind of endearing, but also a little sad. But here's the million dollar question, or in this case, the billion dollar question. Why did we buy into it? Part of it is the magic of the word tech. In today's world, slapping tech onto anything immediately makes it sexier. It's like adding avocado to your toast. Suddenly, it's not just breakfast, it's a lifestyle. WeWork wasn't renting offices, they were creating technology-enabled spaces. Uber wasn't just a taxi service, they were a technology platform for transportation. It's amazing how adding a few buzzwords can turn a mundane business into a disruptive innovation. But here's the thing, real tech innovation isn't just about having an app or using big data. It's about fundamentally changing how things work. Apple didn't just make a prettier phone, they changed how we interact with technology. Amazon didn't just put a store online, they revolutionized retail and cloud computing. WeWork and Uber, for all their hype, didn't really change their industries in any fundamental way. They just made existing services more convenient and wrapped them in a shiny tech packaging. The illusion of tech innovation is powerful because we all want to believe in the next big thing. We want to think we're living in a world where a couple of guys in a garage can come up with an idea that changes everything overnight. And sometimes that does happen. But more often, what we're seeing is old wine in new bottles, served up with a side of Silicon Valley buzzwords and a hefty dose of venture capital. It's time we learn to look past the hype and see these businesses for what they really are. Section 5. Traditional Business Models in Disguise Let's pull back the curtain on these so-called tech companies and see what's really going on. Spoiler alert, it's not as exciting as a Steve Jobs keynote, but it's a lot more honest. What we're dealing with here are traditional businesses dressed up in tech costumes. It's like Halloween, but instead of asking for candy, they're asking for billions in investment. We work when you strip away all the talk about community and technology, is fundamentally a real estate company. They lease buildings, subdivide them, and rent them out at a markup. That's it. That's the big innovation. Sure, they added some cool design elements and free beer, but at its core, this is a business model that's been around since the first caveman figured out he could charge his buddy for sleeping in the dry part of the cave. Uber, similarly, is essentially a taxi dispatch service with a fancy app. The core business, connecting drivers with passengers and taking a cut, is as old as transportation itself. The only real innovation here is using independent contractors instead of employees, which is less a technological breakthrough and more a clever and controversial way to cut costs. Now, don't get me wrong, these companies did innovate in some ways. WeWork made shared office spaces cool and accessible. Uber made getting a ride more convenient in many cities. But these are incremental improvements on existing models. 
not the revolutionary changes they claim to be. It's like adding cup holders to a car and claiming you've reinvented transportation. Nice feature, sure, but let's not get carried away. Section 6. Regulatory Roadblocks and Financial Fumbles Now let's talk about the elephant in the room, or should I say the regulatory roadblock in the street. Both WeWork and Uber ran into some serious issues when it came to following the rules. It turns out that disrupting industries often means disrupting regulations too, and that doesn't always go over well with the powers that be. Uber, in particular, has been locked in an ongoing battle with regulators around the world. They've been accused of everything from unfair competition with traditional taxis to mistreating their drivers. In London, they temporarily lost their license to operate. In California, they fought tooth and nail against a law that would classify their drivers as employees. It's like they're playing a global game of whack-a-mole with regulators, and they're not always winning. WeWork, on the other hand, ran into trouble with financial regulators when they tried to go public. Their IPO filing was a masterclass in creative accounting and questionable business practices. They had to rewrite whole sections of it because apparently making it up as we go along isn't an acceptable financial strategy. Who knew? But here's the real kicker. Both of these companies have struggled to actually make money. Uber, despite its massive scale, has yet to turn a consistent profit. In 2019, they lost $8.5 billion. That's not a typo, $8.5 billion, with a B. WeWork was burning through cash so fast they almost ran out before their failed IPO. It turns out that growing at all costs and worrying about profitability later isn't a sustainable business model. Who could have guessed? Section 7, the scalability myth. Our scalability, the holy grail of the tech world. The idea that you can grow your business exponentially without a proportional increase in costs. It's a beautiful dream, isn't it? Like finding a genie in a bottle, but instead of three wishes, you get unlimited growth potential. Both WeWork and Uber sold investors on this dream. But as it turns out, scaling a business isn't as easy as copy-pasting some code. Let's start with WeWork. Their pitch was that they could keep leasing more buildings, subdividing them and renting them out, growing their revenue without significantly increasing their costs. Sounds great, right? Except for one tiny detail, real estate doesn't scale like software. Each new location requires new leases, new renovations, new staff. It's like trying to franchise a handcrafted artisanal coffee shop. At some point, you're just running a very complicated Starbucks. Uber faced similar issues. Their model was based on the idea that they could keep adding drivers and passengers with minimal additional cost. But again, reality had other plans. As they expanded, they had to spend more on marketing to attract both drivers and riders. They had to deal with different regulations in each new city and country. And let's not forget, the ongoing costs of driver incentives and passenger promotions. It turns out that disrupting the entire global transportation industry is a bit more complicated than updating an app. The scalability myth is seductive because it promises infinite growth with finite resources. It's the business equivalent of a perpetual motion machine. But in the real world, growth always comes with costs. Sometimes those costs are hidden, sometimes they're deferred, but they're always there. And when your business model is based on traditional services rather than truly scalable technology, those costs can quickly outpace your growth. Section 8, Investor Hype and the Bubble Effect. Let's talk about the real fuel behind the WeWork and Uber Rockets Investor Hype. It's like financial Red Bull giving these companies wings made of dollar bills. But just like with energy drinks, what goes up must come down, often with a nasty crash. The tech investment world has become a hype machine, pumping up valuations faster than a bodybuilder on steroids. 
Here's how it works. A company comes along with a slick pitch about how they're going to disrupt an industry. They throw around buzzwords like AI, blockchain and synergy. Investors get excited. They start imagining the next Google or Amazon. Money starts pouring in. The company's valuation skyrockets. More investors jump on board afraid of missing out. It's like a game of financial hot potato with everyone trying to cash in before the music stops. This creates a bubble effect. Companies like WeWork and Uber were valued at astronomical amounts before they ever turned a profit. WeWork was valued at $47 billion at its peak. Uber was valued at $82 billion when it went public. These numbers were based more on potential and hype than on actual financial performance. It's like valuing a restaurant based on how good their menu sounds without ever tasting the food. But here's the problem with bubbles. They always pop. When WeWork tried to go public, investors finally took a hard look at their financials and realized the emperor had no clothes. The valuation plummeted. Uber's stock price dropped significantly after its IPO as investors grappled with its ongoing losses. It turns out that at some point, companies need to actually make money, not just promises. Who knew? Section 9. The True Cost of Disruption Now let's talk about the D word that gets thrown around more than a frisbee at a college quad, disruption. WeWork and Uber both claimed they were disrupting their respective industries. But here's the thing about disruption, it often comes with a hefty price tag. And I'm not just talking about financial costs. Let's start with Uber. Sure, they made getting a ride more convenient in many cities, but at what cost? They've been accused of destroying the traditional taxi industry, leaving many career drivers struggling. They fought against classifying their drivers as employees, denying them benefits and job security. And let's not forget the impact on traffic and emissions in cities already struggling with congestion. It's like solving a Rubik's Cube by peeling off all the stickers. Sure, all the sides match now, but at what cost? WeWork, on the other hand, disrupted the commercial real estate market. They drove up the price of office space in many cities, making it harder for small businesses to find affordable locations. Their model of long-term leases and short-term rentals left them vulnerable to economic downturns, potentially destabilizing the real estate markets they operated in. It's like playing Jenga with the housing market. Fun until the whole thing comes crashing down. But perhaps the biggest cost of this type of disruption is the erosion of trust. 